Um, so, um, yeah, I'd firstly just like to start by saying um, thank you to, to ODI for hosting this evening's event and um, providing a platform for discussion on where youth sit in post-2015 and within the broader development agenda and we're really looking forward to the discussion that's going to follow. Um, so, as Adam said, I coordinate the, the DFID CSO Youth Working Group. And about a year ago, we could see that there, there was this gap, um, if not a virtual absence, uh, of youth voice and leadership in the post-2015 process. Uh, so we set about to do, do a couple of things to change this. And if you've been following the process, you're probably already aware of, of the kind of uh, increase in visibility that youth have had over the last kind of six to nine months. So we ran consultations in 12 countries globally, and I'm going to discuss um, that in a bit more detail. Um, but we also facilitated as restless development roundtables in uh, Bali, Monrovia and uh, London uh, during the UN high level panel outreach meetings. And together with Plan International, we set up the Beyond 2015 Children and Youth uh, Working Groups, part of the Civil Society Co Coalition, which was largely in response to the high numbers of um, inquiries that the coalition was receiving from youth and youth organisations about how to engage in the process. Um, and throughout this, our, our aim has very much been to um, facilitate kind of diverse youth participation from North and South, uh, the global North and South, um, supporting them to have, um, where possible, a unified voice, recognising diversity, but as much as possible, um, trying to find uh, unity and using that to kind of influence around key moments. So, so maybe a few points of why we think... Um, why we think youth voices should count in this process. So I won't go into any, any more detail into st statistics that Paula's already laid it out very clearly. Um, but of course, there are some very um, you know, demographic um, statistics um, staring us in the face. Um, so half the world is under 25. Um, but in uh, countries like Tanzania, actually, half the world is under 15. Um, so this becomes really quite staggering um, in many of the countries that we're, that we're um, talking about here today. Um, more than 30% 30 30 of 15 to 24 year olds live, a, live under $2 a day um, and in less than three generations, 41% of the world's youth will be African. So just kind of a few statistics in terms of getting our heads around the kind of the dynamics um, that we're looking at. So I think as the largest demographic bar none, I would say. Um, I think young people will be the difference between the success and failure of any future development framework. And that youth um, have the agency to be the banner, banner carrier of development, but only if they're effectively included as partners and leaders in the creation, implementation and the monitoring of goals. Um, young people are present in, in every marginalised group, so um, whether we're talking about mothers, people with disabilities, people living with HIV, slum dwellers, these are just a few. Um, we're talking about, to a great extent, young people, but I think a challenge to us all is how often do we look at development and these broader issues through a youth lens? Um, perhaps that's something we can talk about um, in the discussion. Um, and, you know, as Restless Development and the Youth Working Group, um, w as we see it, development won't work if we don't look through it um, through this youth lens um, and apply it to, to policy and practice. And by a youth lens, we're not only talking about um, the needs and rights of young people with respect to education, health and livelihoods, um, what's widely regarded as youth, de youth development. Of course, that is so important and fundamental that we do that. Um, but I'm talking about the, the role that young people can, must, and let's not forget are already playing um, to address some of the most urgent issues facing their countries and the world. Um, in other words, how youth agency can deliver for wider society across all development goals, uh, such as governance, climate adaptation, tackling discrimination, again, some of the issues that, that Paula um, was outlining. Um, so we want space for, for innovation and bringing new ways of thinking um, to, to harness the way that this millennial generation see the world and you know, to capture the imagination of policy, policy leaders as we do this. Um, and I, I would say this is more radical than youth development, as important as that is. Um, it's this kind of... Uh, it's about youth in development. Um, and in our work with the international youth partners, um, we hear time and time again about the co this contribution that young people are making. But I think it's rarely systematically documented, invested in, or, or scaled up for impact. 
Um, but I want to talk briefly about the, the youth consultation project on post-2015 and how it came about and offer some, some reflections on how a youth lens to post-2015 framework can deliver for, for the wider process as well, not just about the issues that young people are prioritising. Um, so the, the youth working group wanted to pilot an innovative network-based approach that could generate youth participation and policy making, and this was really important to us. Um, that working together we could develop common tools, methodologies and resources that to an extent most of our partners wouldn't have had the capacity or the, the funding to do on their own. Um, especially because so many or youth organisations are relatively small scale, community based. Um, and of course this might sound like an obvious, uh, obvious approach but it happens you know, much less frequently than you would think. Um, so, at the at the heart of this uh, project sat the the youth consultation toolkit, uh, which you can see on the screens, um, which we developed with funding from the EC Youth in Action program, um, and it was developed by our consultant Katie Chadwick, who's here today, sitting over there, um, who um, and it literally provides a, a session by session um, outline of of running a youth consultation. Um, with the kind of encouragement for adapting it to local contexts, um, encouraging diversity of participation and so on. So our official partners, um, many of whom I'm delighted to say are, are here today, uh, ran it in 12 countries globally from, from Colombia to Ghana, um, Kyrgyzstan, the Philippines, um, over a three month period at the end of 2012. Um, and I think running for consultations has for many organisations gone on to stimulate their further engagement in the process and given them kind of more confidence to engage where it wasn't necessarily something that they they had done previously. Um, so then um, in February we had held um, some pictures of the consultations there um, and then in uh, February we held a youth-led analysis workshop which you can see with the um, kind of uh, the picture there on the right and um, then led to the development of a final report and the kind of issues that have been prioritised um, are things such as governance, health, education, um, that were really kind of top of the priorities. And I think particularly for themes like governance, it's um, in many ways, I think, surprised particularly people who aren't working with young people, that these are issues that young people are looking much broader than just their most immediate direct needs, um, that whilst these issues tally with the findings across civil society, um, that, yeah, this, this came out something quite strongly. And similarly, when we were talking about, um, about uh, principles and values, that the issues like equality, respect for diversity um, came out really strongly. Um, so I know that uh, that time is short, so I'm going to kind of to skip a bit. Um, I do want to. Oh, there we go. Some more pictures. I, again, I think kind of in terms of what was striking is the the analysis that was done on the solution. So young people weren't just asking for mm -hmm. more schools, for example. They're pushing for the reform of the education system, um, and they're not just talking about the role that they can play um, in in governance, but how you can support wide scale civic participation of of all groups and particularly marginalised people. Um, so, in kind of a very quick a quick sum up. Um, wanted to kind of pause on a, a what can we learn from the way that, that young people are engaging th in this process. Um, and there are three things I want to talk about. Uh, respect for diversity, um, the role of youth as full and equal partners, um, and kind of collaboration, really. Um, so on the first, as I mentioned at the start, um, young people are present in, in all of these, what we would uh, typically term marginalised groups, vulnerable people, people who are often excluded from development. Um, and they're, they're quite often um, in these processes uh, one of the first groups to speak out on these issues as well. And they've really gained some recognition, particularly from high level panellists like John Podesta, about, about what they've done kind of consistently throughout this process. Um, but how can this be used for kind of greater influence in the process? How can we use this to, to stimulate the broader? conversation and to make sure that the framework speaks to these issues. Um, secondly, um, that you know, I think in this it's not just the, the what that matters to young people, so yes it is about the content, it is about the policy goals that we're shooting for, but it, I think it's ver also very much about how young people are involved in this process, that by 2015 how that means that young people are recognised as fully and equal partners in development for the implementation of it. 
Um, and then just finally, how could the, the youth sector be you know, demonstrating this new model of engagement and collaboration? Um, coalitions aren't anything new, but I think that youth organisations are good at finding a unified voice and often putting organisational egos aside where bigger organisations who are more established find it more difficult to do so. Um, we've certainly seen this in the high level panel um, and I think if the youth sector continues to do it in this way then we'll be setting a standard for collaboration um, and global partnership and potentially putting ourselves at an advantage in the process. I'll stop there. Thank, Thank you. you very much, <laughs> Fix. Thank you so much. Um, I think uh, the, the, the punchline is making, making young, young people's voices count and I think you've set that out very clearly. So um, moving on then. Um,